Paul, I have to pick up where you left off, I think, and, and just say uh, policy without resources is rhetoric. And, and I think that's the challenge that we face, not only in terms of, of some of our pandemic planning, and I, I'm going to give some kudos here in a minute, but really more broadly, as Frank has alluded to, to the all hazard preparedness that we need as a nation. Because regardless of what's going to happen with this particular pandemic, if it is a pandemic or this particular influenza strain, we still have the idea that we're going to have natural catastrophes, witness Hurricane Katrina, uh, earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, fires, whatever of that nature. But we also are engaged in a, in a pretty uh, extreme struggle with a foe who's committed to use these kinds of weapons, biological and otherwise, against our homeland. And that's Al Qaeda and other uh, radical extremists out there. And so that in some way, this is a very gentle reminder of what really we should be putting full time, full energy, and full resources behind. Uh, again, to note that we're in the first, if this were a movie with this particular influenza strain, this would be the opening credits of the movie. We're looking at a probable an 18 month kind of evolution of this virus. It can certainly stay as it is. It can certainly become more virulent. It could become less virulent. But I think what we've seen so far and what we're learning every day, if you've been following the press, as noted today's in New York Times, about the, the vulnerability of, of pregnant women in, uh, to this virus. And we learned last week about the vulnerability of young people, you know, youngsters to this virus. Hallmarks of, of I think, of what we experienced in 19, 1918, but certainly not as severe as we witnessed in 1918. But guess what? While the flu season may be over in the northern hemisphere, it's just beginning in the southern hemisphere. And if you also note that the flu is also, this particular virus has been identified in China and Japan. So it's now mixing in the southwest uh, Asia part of the world where we have this little thing H5N1 that was the real concern that really motivated the country uh, to begin serious pandemic preparedness. Uh, and just a quick set of kudos is to my predecessor, uh, Rajiv and Kai and his staff, who did the yeoman's work on pull, pulling together the, the pandemic strategy, which I'll give you a couple of minutes worth here in a moment, uh, as well as the plan, uh, which is one of the things, I would say one of the good things the Obama administration has inherited from the last administration. And so with that, I'd like to compliment the Obama administration how they've moved out on this and really effectively, I think, communicated the concern, not panic, concern to the American people, identified this as a long-term issue, not a short-term flash in the pan, and are doing the kind of preparedness activities, particularly around producing the needed pandemic influenza vaccine as well as seasonal flu vaccine to put us in the best position next fall should this thing really go a different way or, or become more virulent. The one thing I want to talk about, you know, and again, is to highlight, you know, lessons learned is, first of all, we not only need to learn these lessons, we need to move on these lessons as we move forward. Because as Paul mentioned earlier, this is an evolving threat that we just need to kind of get our game up for. Again, a gentle reminder of how things can develop. But first of all, we need to realize that no plan, regardless of what the assumptions were, whether they're right or wrong, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's an old military adage, but I think it's an appropriate one here because it really requires us to be agile, to, to basically learn and adapt based on what we see on a daily basis and then anticipate how this virus may evolve. And again, clearly some of the assumptions were, were frankly off base, uh, but not surprisingly off base. And again, that's the nature of the business, I think, when you talk about preparedness is having to deal with surprise. We have been terribly bad uh, as a nation to try to predict these threats, whether it be pandemics, you know, again, the, one of the planning assumptions around the H5N1 pandemic planning was that we'd have about five years based on best guesses when we would confront a pandemic. Guess what? We were wrong. And so we'll probably be wrong about anticipating other events, whether they be deliberate or natural. And so this really does require us to infuse this idea of a sense of urgency around how do we prepare today? Rahm Emanuel is known to say we shouldn't let any crisis go unwasted. And I think this is one for the purposes of preparedness in the broadest sense should not go wasted in terms of what we need to do to basically ensure that our nation has the needs that, are, that have to be met with our populations. 
just to give you a couple ideas of what the strategy was, the federal strategy was, when it came to this particular pandemic or any pandemic. It was this idea that we need preparedness and communications. And I think in some ways you could say that, you know, we were, we were well prepared, not optimally prepared, but it's reassuring to know that the American public thinks that the communication that has been going on between the public health community, and again, kudos to Rich Besser and his crew at CDC, that they have basically, uh, you know, effectively communicated with the American public in a way that has been informative and not not uh, alarming. The other thing that that was uh, noted or part of the strategy was this idea of surveillance and detection. Paul again noted that we have done some, some things well. We were really focusing on our outward-looking surveillance or overseas uh, surveillance, and we highlighted the fact that our domestic surveillance is suboptimal. <clears throat> Clearly, this has been an issue that has been central to the idea of biodefense for the nation since 2003. And again, a central element of that is having a robust surveillance system. And again, this hasn't been lost in the health IT issue, particularly when one of the central ideas around that uh, initiative uh, that Secretary Levitt announced several years ago was the idea of the role of surveillance, particularly in information technology systems. We are not there yet, but this should be, again, a, a, a reminder and an impetus to basically move on and forward on that. And the last piece is response and containment. Uh, we can see that the objectives that were outlined in the national strategy to basically slow the spread of a virus in the United States was basically uh, lost on the first day that the virus occurred. Uh, a little anecdote, something worthy to note, and again, sometimes how our investments in these areas often bring fruit in ways we don't anticipate. The first case that was identified was actually in a DOD, a Department of Defense Dependent in San Diego. The surveillance system that was used there was a novel one, if you will, a pilot program that was actually funded by the State Department as part of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Amazing how that works. The intent of that program was really to focus overseas, but one of the benefits, unintended benefits, unintended consequences was it enhanced our domestic surveillance. And so we should look for those opportunities to basically proceed forward. The second issue was limit the domestic spread of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, virus and mitigate death and, and disease. In some ways, we, we basically went to the playbook and in some ways maybe responded as we would have with an H5N1 kind of scenario, but then backed off as appropriate. So again, it requires this agility and real-time thinking and assessment that's very difficult when you look at a federal system with 50 states and, the, uh, 50 states and then, what, 3,500 st state and local public health departments that you have to coordinate with and basically make sure that the kinds of information, situational awareness, what are the best practices that need to be considered are done. And then the last thing that the federal government is responsible or sees as a central role in a pandemic is basically ensuring that we sustain our economy and maintain critical infrastructure and the critical operations of our government, whether that be food, delivery of food to your grocery stores, or whether that would be uh, ma maintaining the energy, the power in your systems, or healthcare in general, those are the kinds of things that are, are really required. So we have the luxury now of several months to really kind of get our game up to see how well we can be better prepared, again, for the fall season if should, this should occur. I'm going to diverge here a little bit from the domestic side and just highlight what I think are some national security issues and I think equity issues that I would love to get into discussion later. It seems like the United States is going to be do it, will do all right in light of this virus, even if it were to become more virulent. I think the question we have to ask ourselves, what about the rest of the world? What about the rest of the world as it relates to political and social instability? If you were to overlay this with the current economic downturn, and again, in a severe economic downturn, for the United States alone, the Congressional Budget Office identified that we'd have about a 4.25 decrease in our gross domestic product. What the, and we can see what the economic impact it had on Mexico, even for such a shortened duration. What a significant downturn that took for that country, even with a couple of weak uh, imposition, self-imposition. And again, they should be lauded. Kudos to them for taking extraordinary mem uh, measures that were certainly at a disadvantage to their nation, but really to the advantage of the world. But we have to ask ourselves as a nation, what are we going to do to help mitigate this? Certain areas of the world we have special interests in, such as the Middle East, 
such as Iraq, such as Afghanistan and Pakistan, where if you were to superimpose uh, even a mild pandemic, that could have a very significant negative impact to the overall situation there. But certainly we have broader responsibilities as it relates to the rest of the world and what we could do to assist in terms of providing the diagnostics that are necessary, the kinds of education, again, teaching people how to fish, uh, the kinds of social mitigation steps that we could do that could certainly en enhance uh, uh, the, the containment of disease and certainly vaccine. But it's not one thing, it's just not vaccine alone. It's a panoply of things that we need to be engaged in. And we are engaged in, I can tell you that up to this point. But certainly something we have to keep on our radar, radar scope. Uh, I'm just going to make two last points here. And again, to carry on a point that, uh, that Paul made earlier about the role of logistics. In the military vernacular, strategy is for amateurs, logistics is for professionals. And the reality is, is that the logistics will determine the success of our <coughs> effort in terms of dealing with this pandemic or any other natural or deliberate outbreak. And we have a long way to go on that. The issue of vaccinations, the issues how do we distribute antiviral drugs, how do we distribute antibiotics if they were to bio, be a bioterrorism event. And let me make a very sharp distinction here between what we're faced today. We talked about the idea that in, an, in a pandemic we have 18 months to kind of live learn and adapt and respond to this kind of event that this is indeed a pandemic. The practical reality is in a bioterrorism event, it's over in a week. If there were to be an anthrax event in a major metropolitan area, you could bet that success or failure will be determined after three or four days of that response. And when you could look at the potential impact of that, economically, up to $2, two trillion, that was uh, the estimates of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House when I was there, and the, the Im human impact, which could be 300 more thousand lives lost if we weren't able to successfully mount a response. I think it just highlights the fact that we have to take these opportunities, and again, this is a real drill, if you will, with this pandemic, is look how we can make the improvements, not only from the federal government, but down to state and local levels where it really matters. Clearly, we have not invested in our public health infrastructure sufficiently enough. It has gone through sinusoidal kind of funding streams that have basically resulted in whipsawing the public health community, local public health community, to hire people, then fire people, then hire people, then fire people. It does not sustain or maintain a public health professional cadre that this nation needs for the 21st century. So I would say that that is a significant element of uh, I think at that point, I would like to close my uh, comments by saying, uh, to get to, back to the movie uh, analogy, uh, that we're in the opening phases of this movie. Uh, we don't know how it's going to end up. There'll be a, lots of twists and turns. There are going to be a few villains. There'll be some heroes. But I think the point is, is that we are locked in this movie theater, and this movie is running, and we better watch it carefully because we will live with the consequences of our decisions as we move forward. Thank you.